After I lost all my money, I was like, is there something real here or was it all just vaporware? How did you deal with losing a lot of money and how did you change your mindset after that? The plan for me at the time was actually to... I think those people tend to not do so well over the long term. Jason Choi, the co-founder at Tangent. The host of the Block Crunch podcast and the previous general partner at the Spartan Group. Don't bet what you don't have to win what you don't need. What do you mean by what you don't need? Nobody needs a billion dollars in cash. I think beyond a certain point of money, people are in it for the game. How to get rich in crypto without getting lucky. If you're playing short-term games and trading, I don't think there's anything bad with that. But just be very honest what games you're playing. Being able to think from first principles about what's driving usage here. Is it just short-term speculation or has this protocol actually tapped into something? Something that they can retain over years is probably the number one most important lesson for any investor. What's your biggest loss ever? My biggest loss was probably FTX. And I cashed out all my equity and then put all the equity on FTX. What did you learn from this FTX experience? I try not to let it influence my original thesis on crypto. The silver lining is I'm very glad that I actually got to learn that early on versus when I'm much later in life. You want to explain the Dunning-Kruger effect? The Dunning-Kruger effect is when somebody thinks they have more expertise in a topic than they actually do. And it happens a lot in crypto. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? Um... 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. And Astar Network, a scalable network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development, and community events. Welcome to the podcast, man. Thank you so much for having me. This really? is uh, the most special location I've ever been at. The first one I've done in a long time, too. First one in studio or you've done First others? First podcast in general, okay. like okay. that's outside of my own. Because usually you, you, you are the host, right? Exactly. Today usually I'm, I'm doing the grilling. Today, I, <laughs> today I'm being grilled. There is no grilling here. <laughs> Only good vibes. <laughs> Only good vibes. <laughs> I, I can see you don't, you don't believe me with those <laughs> minds. Like, what's going to happen today? We'll see. We'll see in two hours. Only good stuff. Only good vibes. Let's start with the basics. Yes. Who are you? Uh, my name is Jason. I am an investor in crypto. So now I run an angel fund called Tangent, which I started with my co-founder here in Singapore. So yeah. I moved here about a year ago just to do this, a year and a month ago. From Hong Kong, right? From Hong Kong, yeah. So before this, I was with a fund called Spartan Capital. So I was a partner there for about four years. Uh, and then I decided to kind of spin out on my own and start this fund. Why did you move to Singapore? Is it for Tangent? It was for a couple of things. So I think at that time, Hong Kong was still closed because of COVID, right? So Hong Kong was like one of the last places to really open up uh, from COVID. And I thought, okay, at, at that point, it felt like there was no end to it. It didn't feel like Hong Kong would ever open up. And then second, more importantly, was because my co-founder, uh, Daryl, who was on the show as well, is based in Singapore. Mm. And I think the crypto community in Singapore is quite different as well. There's a younger vibe to it. Um, there's more, more builders in general than Hong Kong. Um, so yeah, I thought I might as well just, you know, move out here and see what it's like. And after a year, it's, it's pretty great. It's awesome. Uh, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. The, it's a bit I, hot. I think it's probably one of, I mean, it's probably, and obviously we're biased, but I think it's the best place on earth to be if you're in crypto in terms of network and community. It's mm. pretty insane. I think so. I, I think it's, I've heard good things about Dubai, but I personally haven't been. Mm. Have you been to Dubai for crypto? Like, I mean, I was there for maybe four or five months in 2021, probably went like 15 times in my life. Mm. The, the thing I would say about Dubai is people might not be happy about that, but it's very, it's much easier. You know, organize these dinners, you came to one of them, right? Mm, yes, in Singapore. Like it's, here it's very easy to know who is like the real deal and mm. serious and who is not, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, most people here are very serious and very humble. Mm. In Dubai, I feel like you, it would be much more likely that one of the people I invite is a scammer or is like it's a, a scammer. Very serious. Yeah, because it attracts <laughs> more people who are, because it's kind of in this gray area, uh. right? In terms of laws and even like, kind of like, 
it attracts people who I would say a bit more questionable. There is a few people. I did right. some interviews there of people who who live there who are really serious, but yes. I don't think you could. I could get the same you know quality of the people like mm. that we have here in mm. these dinners and these masterminds and right, right, on this right. podcast because everyone seems to be everyone serious, mm. low key, humble, successful mm. Mm -hmm. seems to be here. It's definitely more low key here. I, I do like the kind of more stable and quiet. I think people will call it boring sometimes. It's like boring. The, the general perception of Singapore <laughs> crypto scene is that it's it's kind of less wild than the other crypto pockets like New York and so on. But no, I quite like it. I quite like how how quiet it is. So you grew up in Hong Kong, right? Yes. And then you moved to the US? I was in the US for about five years to study and work there. And I actually came back to Hong Kong. I went back to Hong Kong because I couldn't get a visa. Mm. Um, so it was a work visa. I really wanted to stay. So I guess backtracking a little bit, um, I discovered what startups were in the US, right? So when I was growing up in Hong Kong, nobody wanted to do startups. There's no founders, no entrepreneurs. Everybody was a banker, a lawyer, a doctor, or you're a failure, right? So when I went to US, I discovered, hey, actually you can chart a path outside of this. You can do startups. And then at, around that time, I think this movie called The Social Network came out. Mm. I don't know if you've seen that. I watched it. Too. But it's about uh, Mark Zuckerberg yeah. starting Facebook. Um, and then I think that actually inspired a lot of people to, to kind of explore startups and stuff, especially outside of the US, outside of Silicon Valley. So I really wanted to stay in the U.S. and explore that. But um, I don't know if people not in the U.S. know this, but in order to stay there, you need a visa. Um, and most startups cannot afford to sponsor it because it's very, very expensive. Um, so I worked for a big company. I worked in consulting just to get that visa. But even then, couldn't get it. So I just got kicked back to Hong Kong. So that was kind of my five years in, in U.S. But that forced me to go full time in crypto. So that was a blessing in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> in the U.S., you had an internship or worked for Bridgewater, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. What did you learn at Bridgewater that you could not have learned anywhere else? I think Bridgewater is one of the most unique institutions uh, outside looking in. Um, a lot of people hear about the principal stuff mm. that Ray Dalio writes about. Uh, I think he's published so many books now that a lot of people outside the institution knows kind of that how different they are. Um, and I kind of, I, was, I didn't go in with a lot of preconceptions about what it is. I didn't really know what a hedge fund was. But then, um, you know, when I was went going through the internship, I kind of got to see firsthand how something of this scale is run. And uh, how do you actually run something like this with discipline and with principles and with the correct processes and frameworks? So I think um, that kind of forced me to um, think about things from a very disciplined and process driven approach. But first is if I started in TradFi first and then went through that experience, I think I would have some preconceptions, but that kind of taught me how to build a fund. So a lot of the things that I try to incorporate in my own fund right now actually was borrowed from my brief internship there and from the subsequent things that I read there. So things like, for instance, uh, kind of understanding each of your members' unique strengths and weaknesses. I think that was something that um, Bridgewater really, really emphasized, right? So for instance, for, for Tangent, we make everybody take a quiz with like 40 or 50 or so questions. And then it spits out a radar chart that kind of shows you different skills. So maybe some people are better at certain types of investing, certain timeframes, uh, or they have certain dispositions. We make sure that we have a very clear chart of everybody. So that was something that I kind of adapted uh, from that experience. And then there are you know a few other things as well. What was the strength that uh, kind of came out of your test that you did at Bridge Bridgewater? I just remember, I don't know how much, much, how, much, how much I can talk about in terms of the internal processes, but I do remember that the general feedback I was given was that I was horrible, absolutely horrible at high level thinking. So I have no high level thinking at all. I just like go way into the details right away. Mm. So because I was given that feedback at such a young age, this was like 2016, 17, right? Um, I was always very cognizant of that. In every single job that I've had ever since then, I was always thinking, okay, am I thinking high level enough? So that really stuck with me. Um, and I think now it's actually one of my bigger strengths as a portfolio manager and as a boss as well, just to be able to zoom out a bit. So at Bridgewater or even at Tangent, what's the, what's the approach? Is it more, oh, now we spotted that you are really good at that. Mm. Therefore, we're going to make you double down on your strength. Forget what you're not good at. Or, hey, we also help you kind of level up on these few areas that we think you're not good at, but are still important. 
So it's based on what the individual wants. So mm. if, let's say your uh, your radar chart tells you that, hey, you're very good at finding new listings or like new on-chain launches. You're very good at kind of being in the weeds and kind of exploring what's happening on-chain, but you're very, very bad at long-term thesis formation. So you're very bad at making bets for the next five, four, uh, four or five years. Um, then, uh, you know, we might not take your opinion as heavily if you're opining on venture related things, but we might pay, pay a lot of attention when you flag certain things that are in your domain of expertise. Now, but if you are personally interested in venture, then obviously we'll help you kind of work on that as well. Mm. Um, so it's up to what the person wants. So it's a very, very small team right now. We're a team of six. Um, so it, it allows us to explore and experiment a lot. So you told me you had to come back to Hong Kong, right? Yes. No choice. No choice. Destiny is in these guys. Yes. That's how that's destiny right. works. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> it's pretty amazing when you think about it. Yeah. Like, oh man, I wanted to stay in the US, but I couldn't. And then crypto happened, Spartan happened, Tangent. Like, it's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you went back to Hong Kong. Uh, where were you in 2017? 17, I was in New York. Ah, still yeah. in the US, yeah, right? That's right. So in 2017, you, uh, you, sort of discover crypto? I discovered, I think, somewhere in 2016. So I, I went to uh, Wharton, the business school in Philly. Uh, and then one one of the good things is because it's also an MBA school. Mm. So a lot of the undergrads like myself at that time could actually audit MBA classes. So I can just sit in with the, you know, with the, with the grownups and learn serious things. So one of the classes that I audited was FinTech. And in one of the modules, uh, they talked about Ethereum. So this was 2016. And there were like five videos on the internet about Ethereum, one of which is Vitalik just staring into the sky and just like talking about Ethereum for like 30 minutes. And I didn't understand any of it, but I thought it was fascinating. Um, so I started digging a bit and then the ICO stuff happened. Uh, I was in San Francisco at that time, uh, taking a full stack coding bootcamp. I was supposed to be learning how to code because I thought, okay, everybody's learning this. If I don't want to be outdated, I got to learn this. But I ended up spending all my time just on Binance, mm. just looking at new shit coins, <laughs> new ICOs and lost all my money. Um, but that was kind of how I really fell into the rabbit hole. After I lost all my money, I was like, okay, what did I just lose my money on, first of all? And second of all, is there something real here or was it all just vaporware? So I just started reading everything I could find. And that was kind of how it started. So that's really interesting, right? Because you're saying you basically learn crypto by investing, investing, investing most of your money on ICOs <laughs> and then losing most of it, right? Not even ICOs. I did one ICO and then all of it I put on just Binance and I was reading white papers. So I was very fundamentals focused. So I was like, okay, Walton Chain is going to change supply chains forever. Let's put all my net worth in this. Obviously went to zero. Um, so there was no process involved. Uh, I didn't really treat it as investing. I was just like punting around a bit. And then afterwards, I took it more seriously. Is there any other way to learn crypto than by losing money? I think it depends on what you want to do. As a builder, I don't necessarily think you need to lose money on Binance first. But I, I still think that so much of crypto is built for crypto natives, right? There's... Uh, I think you can benefit a lot by understanding what people are using and playing around. So there's almost no downside to just kind of playing around in crypto a bit, even as a builder. So um, hopefully you don't lose money when you do that. I don't think it's a prerequisite, but it, it's helpful to kind of play around. <laughs> so what happened? So you, you're playing with these kind of investments, right? Then you realize, oh man, I lost all my money. What happened? What is all this stuff? What made you stick in crypto and then join Spartan? I think it's a factor, uh, it's, it's a couple of factors. So at that time I was, just keep in mind, I was out of college for like a year. So I was very impressionable mm -hmm. and I was seeing very, very smart people um, still staying in crypto and building. For like, example? For example, my friend uh, Lane Reddick, who's the founder of Space Mesh. Mm -hmm. And back then he was a core developer in Ethereum and the founder of Connext, uh, Arjun at that time. And they were just, I, I, I ran into them in different kind of contexts, but they were kind of explaining Ethereum to me, kind of what layer twos are, why they're fascinated by it. And I thought, okay, if these really smart giga brains are into this, there must be something here more than Walton Chain. So I decided <laughs> to stick around and uh, read all the white papers I could find. And then when I ran out of stuff to read, uh, I decided to reach out to people. And that's how I started the podcast actually, just to get people to talk to me and teach me kind of what crypto is. 
And I think every single conversation just convinced me more that, hey, this is actually something real and serious. When you started podcast? I started, I believe, early 2018. Mm. Yeah, so uh, mid early 2018. Did you have like a grand goal or plan with it? Or you just said, you know what? I'll just like talk to people to learn and I'll just record my conversations and put this online. I wasn't, I definitely wasn't as strategic as, as this. Like we didn't have any of this. Uh, if you watch some of the earlier episodes, I think I came out of a surgery for one of the episodes. I was in a sling. I was in my like uh, 100 square foot apartment in New York, just like huddling over the screen. So it was like horrible production. So it was never meant to be kind of like a large scale media production. It was really just an excuse for me to get people on the show and talk to me for an hour. So mm. people who would never otherwise pick up the phone for me because I was just nobody, just a college grad. Um, so that kind of worked because there's not, not that many podcasts back then. Mm. So we managed to get uh, Adam Draper, uh, who's a VC investor, as the first guest. And then from that point onwards, it just kind of snowballed. I think we got Chris Berniski in episode three or so on. Mm. Uh, we got Meltem Demir. So a lot of the big names, mm. OGs in crypto, were really, really nice to me. And they just came on with kind of no preconceptions, kind of uh, no assumptions. And they just came on and talked to me for, for an hour. This was bear market, right? This was very much so, yeah. This yeah, so it also helps, right? I suppose, yeah. yeah. Uh, it helps a lot because they're like, oh man, especially in 2018, 19, like mm. it was so dead. If it, that's, the, that's the key moment you want to reach out to people because they're like, if you are there in the bear market, yeah. they will take you seriously. There's someone here like who's trying to do something when no one gives a fuck, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of how we started this one. Mm. I mean, actually we started doing the previous bull run online with AirPods and everything. The oh. first guy we had was uh, Matthew Canteri, Anchor Protocol. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fourth guest, Doku, yeah. and fifth guest, Remy Teto, et cetera. And then, but it was kind of like random here and there. Mm -hmm. Like, ah, uh, we tweet something. Oh yeah, come on. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then Luna happened, FTX mm. happened. And I was like, oh man, I think it's, about, it's, a, it's around when you started Tangent, right? Late 2022? Late 2022, uh, we started early-ish 2022. Okay. Yeah. So for me, it was here in this studio. I, I was that's the amazing thing about uh, Singapore and crypto. Yeah. I was living in the same building as Alex Vanevik, right? Oh yeah, in uh, River Valley, and I was just like, "Hey, Alex, from Nansen." Yeah, from Nansen. Yeah, yeah. I was like, "Hey, Alex, like, no one believes in crypto anymore. Even me. I mean, I knew it would come back. But I was like, also after all the shit that happened, yeah, I was yeah, like, how can anyone take this shit seriously, right? Yeah. yeah so yeah. I was like, hey, let's just go in the studio. Mm. And then we just came here. I was sitting here, he was sitting there. Yeah, yeah. And then we just started to talk and I was thinking, oh, let's just do that every week mm. and, mm. and start from there. And that's how you get, I mean, here was the proximity of the people because Singapore mm. is amazing. We're also bear market, right? Mm, mm, mm. Like you reach out, they're like, yeah, let's do it because no one cares about crypto. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, no, that, that was the, that was very much, um, I think a good time to have started a media property. And then I, I think one of the models that I try to emulate was this guy called Harry Stebbings as yeah, well in, in Venture, right? So for people who don't know, <laughs> Harry Stebbings is what well, started as a podcaster when he was like 17, 18 years old. And he just reached out to every single VC he could find. Uh, back then, VCs are not as hated as they are today. Um, but he basically, I think, made a thousand episodes with like the top VCs in the world, world famous people who have invested in all the Web2 giants. And from that, he built a massive network and brand, raised funds. So now he's running, I think, two or three hundred million dollar yeah, funds. Million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was kind of in the back of my mind. I thought, okay, you can actually start with no background and kind of network your way into this. And the way to scale is media. Um, so I, I just, that, that was always kind of, what I wanted to do. So when we started, it was actually 20 minute interviews just to copy. Uh, to copy the 20 VC. Yes, okay. but then we realized 20 minute was way too short. So, <laughs> so we expanded it to an hour. That's so interesting. There's two key points there. Cause I was the same, but, but years later, right? Mm. I was like, I was looking at Stephen Bartlett, mm, mm, mm. right? Uh, Diary of a CEO. Yes. Uh, who I spent some time with in Bali two years ago. And I was like, oh man, like this guy is like starting to blow up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. With podcast when most people say in podcast there's no money and everything it's like yeah. he's doing something right right yeah yeah then i was thinking how do i get seen as a peer by the big people in crypto when i'm not technical mm. i need to provide more value and mm. i'm but what i'm really good at is networking what's networking on steroids podcasting especially mm. in a studio like that spend two hours together yeah then do some events and things together right probably like gonna work out and and then 
it basically comes from Naval podcast that we'll talk about today. Mm. Uh, what are the best type of leverages today? Mm. Code and media. Code and you media, know, yeah. Financial and uh, mm. human is kind of old, uh, old school. I mean, still very important, but like mm. code and media. And like code is not going to be me. Like, but media, why not, right? Mm. And mm. then you put all that stuff together and you see a few guys who've like even uh, Lex Friedman, I think, or even Pomp, basically. They, mm. There's a lot of people criticizing him, but like, these guys, they, they started podcasting in what, 2020? Like mm. they started to be good, you know, the COVID wave, but even Lex, like I think he's not like that that many years, but he just used the MIT brand really well, had like some big people early on, maybe Elon Musk, like mm. 30 epi 30th episode, 30 minutes. Yeah. And then you just, basically it's just, how do you build momentum? Yeah, yeah. And build a mega network. Exactly. And exactly. then see what happens. You're just like, hey, how do I bring value to people without asking for anything in return, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think it was it was such a it was such an alpha back in 2018 because nobody was doing it. There was like mm. four podcasts in crypto, and I was one of them. So it was very well. I wouldn't say it was easy. It was do a lot of work every single week, right? It was like I was editing myself, preparing myself. So it was like eight nine hours on top of my job every day. Um, so it was it was pretty painful. But then it was quick. It, it, it kind of allowed me to quickly differentiate because nobody was doing it. Now I think it's a lot harder. Everybody mm. is aware of this media or code hack. Mm. Um, so now you have to actually compete on quality, right? Mm. Which is why you have this amazing studio. Um, so I have to upgrade to, to be relevant soon as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're doing, focusing on the podcast. Mm. What's the moment you decide I'm going to go all in and join what later became one of the biggest investors in the space, Spartan. Yeah, so I was always interested in startups, as I mentioned, and the way I wanted to do it was through VC because I thought the venture business seems like a dream job, right? If I'm curious about startups, it's like a way to get exposure to like all the startups in one job. So actually before Spartan, before I even graduated, I was helping start a fund called Contrary Capital, which is a Web2 VC fund. So they're still functioning today. I think running maybe like, uh, uh, maybe 30 million for the last fund. Um, so I was through that. I was kind of doing a lot of Web2 investing and I really fell in love with the thought of doing VC. So I never thought about joining a hedge fund. Um, so a lot of people on Twitter might think of me as a VC, but actually most of my time in crypto was spent at a hedge fund because that's how Spartan started. Um, but anyway, I was looking for an investment role. I was talking to different people in the space. Nobody wanted to hire me because I was just like out of college for a year. Um, no official investing experience except for that brief stint at Country Capital. Um, and then very fortunately, I think one of the people that was listening to the podcast happened to me, my former boss, Kelvin. Mm. So I got in touch with Kelvin uh, in Hong Kong. We started chatting. So Kelvin is extremely experienced, right? So he was 20 years in Goldman. He was the head of equity research for all of Asia. So I've, I, I remember looking around at the crypto funds at that time, and there was not a single portfolio manager that had the experience that Calvin had in terms of actually investing for, you know, majority of his uh, career. So I thought, okay, if I wanted to learn, uh, this is the best place to learn. Um, and at, at, at the time, Kel, uh, I think Spartan was like nine, ten million dollars. So it was very much an experimental fund, right? There's no long, short crypto fund. The concept did not exist. Um, but then I thought, okay, this is interesting. Let's learn about this. So through those four years, I kind of learned everything about uh, the hedge fund business from Calvin, and then through that experience, I also dove. A lot into I, I brought a lot of the crypto native network that I've built through the podcast into mm. that as well. So it's a very kind of mutually beneficial experience. Um, so yeah, it was a great great ride. Do you want to tell us maybe because now Spartan is one of the most respected companies in Web three. Yeah, but it was not that obvious in the beginning that it would become right. Mm. Do you want to tell us like how it felt there, even like maybe talking to the founders, how what you could kind of like feel in, in them and in yourself, especially, you know, 2018, 19, lots of uncertainty. Then there is 2020, there is the COVID mm. crash, right? Yes. Which is crazy moment. Yeah, yeah. Where we, we might just think like, I mean, uh, I talked about that with Casper here. Interesting moment to say the least, a lot of hedge funds actually blew up yes. that day. Yeah, yeah. Right? So what's the... What, what was it like in the beginning of at Spartan and maybe what's the craziest or like scariest moment in uh, that you experienced in the beginning of Spartan? Yeah, I think um, when I joined, we were very, very small. Right? As I mentioned, it was very experimental. 
So there were a lot of things that needed to be done besides just investing. So I was uh, the first hire on the fund for uh, full time. So it was me and Calvin. So I was the analyst there. Um, but I was really doing a lot more than just kind of picking names and pitching things. So we were doing hiring. I had to do a lot of marketing and branding, sometimes help with fundraising as well. So the firm building aspect of it was something that I don't think most people will get exposure to until they are like 50 years old, mm. right? Working at traditional hedge fund. So that was one of the biggest surprises for me. Um, it, it wasn't a scary thing, but it was a little bit intimidating. In terms of like market moments, I think uh, May 2021 was pretty scary. Uh, there mm. was a massive market crash for no apparent reason, right? It wasn't like the COVID crash, w which reversed relatively quickly because of the QE uh, kind of um, kicking into activation afterwards. May 2021 caught a lot of people off guards. A lot of people blew up because nothing really happened. It was just kind of cascading liquidations. So when BTC went down like 50% yes. very quickly, right? Yeah, yeah. For, for no reason at all. I was um, actually in quarantine here and I was watching my portfolio getting decimated yeah, from yeah. the quarantine. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There was no kind of, it, 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 I'm sure there were a lot of reasons, yeah. but there was no discernible one catalyst. Yeah. So nobody saw it coming. I think a lot of people around us were in deep pain. And that was the first time when I realized, wow, this asset class is like very, very volatile, <laughs> even though I, I kind of already knew that. Um, but I think the disciplined approach that we have saved us, right? So we never really lever up. We don't trade that much. Uh, it was just like finding things that we have conviction in and uh, the lower they go, the more we want to buy. Mm. Um, so I think that conviction lent itself uh, to the stability of the fund and the survival of the fund and now they're thriving a lot. Um, and that is something that I carry to this day, right? To Even to Tangent as well. We try to only invest in things we have conviction in so that we're not shaken out by the insane volatility of this mm -hmm. asset class. So 2020 and 2021 were pretty crazy. Pretty crazy time to be in crypto. Pretty much the definition of up only, right? Yes. But I don't think there is anything to learn from people who make a lot of money quickly no. in a bull market because as the meme goes, you know, everyone is a genius in a bull market. It's... Yeah. Making money is very easy. Mm. What's hard is to keep it. Keep it, yeah. What's your biggest loss ever? My biggest loss, I think actual loss was probably FTX, uh, just personally. Um, this is after I was uh, decided to, I decided to step down from Spartan to focus on Tangent, to uh, kind of spin out and try, uh, try my own luck at it. Um, and then I cashed out all my equity and then put all the equity on FTX as a bank account almost because uh, there's not too many on-ramps and off-ramps and I just thought, okay, let's just keep it here for a while. And then obviously all of that was lost. So at that time, it felt like everything I've built in the past four years, building a firm from, you know, nine, ten million million to half a billion dollars, all that effort, four years of just no sleeping, just went down the drain in one shot. Um, so I think that was um, a bit of a hit. But then but other than that, I think I've been able to kind of manage drawdowns pretty well. So not too many horror stories, uh, fortunately. How did you deal with losing a lot of money? That obviously is money, right? Mm. Is a lot of cash. But even more importantly, as you just said, right, it represents years of work. And even more importantly, it represents the ability to have a safe net that allows you to take more risk in the future. Mm. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so the plan for me at the time was actually to take that equity and take some of the money I've made from angel investing or my PA account or whatnot and just plow it into Tangent and start a prop fund. And then that actually that equity was not supposed to go into Tangent. Right? So the equity was going to be my, my safety net um, to, to keep my uh, life expenses. So obviously that didn't, that didn't work out. So we had to make some adjustments to how we started Tangent. Um, so Tangent ended up being a much bigger part of my total assets than I intended. So at that time, a lot of my friends thought it was crazy, right? This is like bear market, uh, things were blowing up left and right. And here I am just plowing everything I have into this prop fund. We're not even using other people's money. It's just our own money. Um, so obviously in hindsight, it, it was a great decision, but at that time it was pretty scary. It's pretty scary. But my kind of framework was uh, always regret minimization, right? I'm young enough that I think and capable enough that if I ever lose all of this, I know I can come back because I've done it once already. Um, so, and I also realized that um, your risk appetite goes down with age. And it's not really because you lose your balls, but it's really just because you have uh, increasing obligations and you start to associate money with things in life. 
Yeah. Right. So if you have kids, you start to think that, hey, that wasn't just like a shitcoin bet gone wrong. That was my kid's tuition. Right. This could have been a family vacation to Hawaii. So you start thinking in those terms. Yeah. It really messes you up. So I want to make sure that I take risks uh, before I have to start thinking about those things. And there's not too many years left that I can do that. So at that point, it was very clear that, hey, tangent is something I need to do now. Hey, when shift happens, family. Time to toast our partner, Divin. They're taking luxury wine to the blockchain with their super fun concept called Uncork to Earn. Buy your favorite wines, enjoy unique experiences, and get an airdrop each time you open a bottle with your friends. Cheers to Divin for bringing transparency, authenticity, and exclusivity to the fine wines industry. What did you learn from this experience, like this FTX experience? And how did you change your mindset after that? I think I was, uh, I try not to let it influence my original thesis on crypto, uh, which is that the technology is, uh, has a lot of potential and it's one of the more disruptive things uh, that I've seen in my life. But after, after going through the whole FTX situation, obviously you, you become a little bit more cynical, uh, especially because a lot of the people involved in FTX were kind of friends of mine, right, in Hong Kong, right, because their initial headquarters before they moved to yeah. Bahamas was in Hong Kong. So there was a level of kind of distrust that arise that arose from that. I'm not sure if, you know, whether these guys screwed me or whether they were victims as well. So there was definitely a lot of just like, um, I guess, more arm's length relationships from that point onwards. Um, but it also kind of wisened me up, right? I don't think a lot of people in finance get to experience these type of high profile, massive crisis that often, right? We had the Luna thing and then we have this thing back to back. Um, so I think that wisened me up. I think I was able to learn lessons that people might only learn when they're 10, 20 years into their careers and once in their lives. So I, I, the silver lining is I'm very glad that I actually got to learn that early on versus mm -hmm. when I'm much later in life. That's so true. I mean, it, it might not feel like that at, at the time, but it's true like you, at least it makes you, it keeps you humble for the future when things are going well. Yeah. It's, it's one of these things that you learn in self-awareness and in meditation, right? Mm. If I'm having a bad day, it's going to get better. Mm, mm. If I'm having a great day, it's going to get worse. So like, yeah. chill, bro. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> like, exactly, exactly. There's no reason to feel like you're a god because yeah, you yeah. probably are not, right? Mm, mm, mm. And uh, you're going to get humbled sooner or later. Yeah. So it, it keeps you, I think it's uh, Arthur Cheong who says that, actually he was on the podcast who he was saying, I'm a cynical optimist, something like that. Right? Mm, mm. Because after all the shit that happened, and he had like really bad shit happening to him. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, it's, you need to stay optimistic, but don't be dumbly optimistic. Mm. You know, hold all to the moon uh, upon yeah. me. Uh, exactly. All bullshit exactly. There exactly. I think there's, a, I think <laughs> a lot of people in this industry come to the same realization. I remember I had cynical optimism in my Twitter bio. Uh, and then okay. after a while I thought, okay, this is a bit too on the nose. So I took it off. <laughs> and then now I go on Arthur's profile. It's on his as well. So I think yeah, we, we arrived okay. at the same conclusion kind of separately. Um, but yeah, it, it's hard not to be cynical if you're in crypto for a while, because it is true. A big part of this industry are uh, bad actors. But I just try to, you know, make sure I focus on the good ones. One of the things I talked about with Arthur actually was, uh, and it's very like, it's very linked to this notion of it's very hard to not be cynical. Mm. People who are really successful in crypto will not give financial advice. Mm. Will not, I mean, obviously, I mean, no, no financial advice, right? But like, <laughs> They will not even tell their friends mm. that they should buy crypto or Bitcoin. Yeah. Because they know that there is no upside to it, right? Mm. Because if the thing is going up, then the other person is a genius, the one who bought, right? Yeah. Uh, and if things go down, you're the asshole, right? Mm -hmm. So at some point you learn. And you also learn that even if you tell your friends all the kind of best practices to not get wrecked, mm. or most of them, because it's, it's not possible to have all of them, right? they will still do the wrong things because yeah. they're greedy and they're not going to listen and then they're going to do shit and you're going to be the asshole, right? So yeah. what's the incentive for you to even tell them in the first place um, that they should buy, right? So if yeah. you find yourself just telling your friends, you should buy crypto, it's the future, you yeah. probably haven't been wrecked enough because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you would not do it, right? Yeah, that's why I think with the podcast as well, I know some of my friends listen to it. Uh, we never talk about prices. We never give mm. any financial advice. I never tell, hey, these are my top 10 altcoin picks that you should buy. It's always about 
what makes this project interesting, right? So it's it's why am I interested in this? What is its implications for society? Mm-hmm. Uh, how does it compare to previous attempts that came before? We never ever talk about price, no price targets. Um, I do think that that you know financial decisions are deeply personal, right? Like who who am I to tell you to buy Bitcoin or not? Mm-hmm. So I try not to, yeah, I try not to engage in that as well. But if you think about the online game, mm. why why are people, if you think very first principle, why are people in crypto? To make money, most of them, right? Mm. Most of them is to make money. Mm. It's not like, oh, for the, in it for the tech or whatever, it's not, right? And what do people want to hear? Price prediction, what do they click on, right? If mm. you're building a media company, mm. you should lean into that. But if you're doing that, basically you're doing the completely wrong thing. So, mm. which means that most of the people who are being, followed for their advices online are actually the wrong people. Mm. That's what that's kind of the conclusion we got with Arthur. Mm. It's it makes no sense because the people who should be listened to are basically not sharing anything or not much, at least mm. in terms of like what they invest in. Mm. And then the people who share all that stuff are the ones who are being followed on YouTube or even Twitter. You have all these traders or influencers, KOL and all mm. this crap, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then but people want that, right? People mm-hmm. right? So they're being fed what they want, but it's ultimately is kind of what is going to kill them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I do think price is a Trojan horse, right? We all came in because we thought, okay, there might be a financial return. Like we're not going to be in this if we think there's no money to be made. But I do think um, kind of once people are looped into the space by promises of this kind of financial return or potential promises, uh, they start to dig into the tech and they realize, oh, this mm. is actually much bigger than just number go up. Um, because that was my journey, exactly, right? I, I came in because I thought ICOs seem interesting, everybody's making money. And then I looked in the tech and I thought, this is actually really, really interesting. I haven't mm. seen anything like this. What are your profit-taking rules to avoid what happened to you with FTX in the future? I don't think it was really a profit-taking rule on FTX. It's more of a custody risk rule. So uh, we have very strict rules around how much assets we can keep on what venues. Um, we have very kind of strict guidelines on OPSEC as well. Um, in general, I think I've always been quite disciplined as a profit taker. Uh, I think with, with 2021 December, I basically just sold everything because um, I thought uh, there are a lot of qualitative signs that the market has topped. And I know that uh, crypto is a deeply cyclical market. Mm. Um, so I was able to kind of just cash out everything in December 2021. Um, and then even throughout the cycle, uh, we have rules that, okay, if we think a drawdown of more than X percent is coming and the hit to the portfolio could be, you know, Y percent, then we need to take Z percent off. So it's, it's very kind of procedural, uh, very standardized. It's, it's not just kind of, you let's go all in and let's lever up kind of thing. How about taking profits from crypto into cash or into real world assets, right? Which mm. is what ultimately... You know, you, you might have bought, I, w- one of the things I was very critical of is like the guys were flexing uh, 500,000 bucks richer meal, right? Mm-hmm. Or whatever, like, oh, I bought a car or, yeah. but actually <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> actually bought, uh, the only thing that I really bought in my life that was expensive was a Rolex, like for I think 60K or something like that. But I bought it with UST, mm. which in hindsight was like, it's great and, then, and <laughs> I bought it at the absolute pico top of the watch market. Yeah. So then it lost like 30% or whatever. Yeah. But it was still amazing yeah. compared to like the UST that went to zero, right? Yeah. Do you have anything like that where you're thinking, that's why I asked, you know, like you had your cash in FTX, but like, mm. okay, it's at this part of the cycle, I need to have cash in the bank, basically. Mm. Mm. It's boring and it's not what crypto people want. It's not what I want either, but like, yeah it's going to protect you from a lot of shit, right? Because yeah. even if the banks fail, as we saw with the banking crisis, mm. the Fed is there to, I mean, the central banks are there to kind of save the depositors. Mm, mm. I think for me, it comes down to uh, the broader question of risk appetite and kind of risk hedging across domains of life, right? So mm. uh, Adam Grant, who was a professor at, at Wharton, um, he wrote about how the best entrepreneurs are not necessarily the people who take the most risk, even though they are portrayed to be big risk takers, they're actually people who are the best at managing risks. So people who take massive risks in one domain of life must have stability in other aspects of life. Um, So it's kind of like, I think the analogy I think of is everybody is given uh, roughly the same amount of wood and you have to build a table that's as stable as possible. So um, the table holds basically all of the the risk that you can you know, you can, you can support. So obviously the bigger the table, 
um, the more risks you can support. But probably the more legs you have to build, the more stability you need underneath to support it. Or you can choose to build a smaller table or take less risk and just have like one leg mm. and you don't need that much stability. Maybe you just have a stable marriage and that's it. Everything mm. else is crazy. It's mm. fine. So for me, it's always a constant balance of, okay, how much risk am I taking at this point in my life? Uh, having a lot of my assets in a prop fund in crypto is probably pretty high risk. So that might mean I need like three or four very stable licks um, in other aspects of my life. So I make sure that all aspects of life are taken care of. So I think backwards from there, okay, if I want this stability, how much money do I need? Then I take it out and basically just finance my lifestyle for like the next 10 years or so. So if you're all in crypto, which you pretty much are, you say there is through three to four other legs that you focus on that should be stable, what are they? Yeah, so I'm not all in crypto. I had to take some out to make sure I kind of support the lifestyle. I think family is a big, big one for me. Mm. I think that's what I really like about Singapore as well, is uh, the family concept is very, very strong. Everybody's mm. married by 22, right? Everybody has kids by like 25 and all, all my friends are getting married very, very young. And I actually quite enjoy the stability that that brings to some of my friends uh, in terms of the topics they talk about, what they focus on, their life priorities versus some of my friends back in the US are quite different. So I, I quite enjoy um, having a very stable family and personal relationships. I think having some sort of pursuit that is progressive in the sense that you can progress through it mm. uh, makes a lot of sense. So it could be some sort of sport that you can get better and better at, some sort of musical instrument that you can master over time um, or learning maybe a new language over time. I think those are very, very important as well. So for me, I picked up uh, jujitsu about a year ago, probably 10 years too late in my life because now mm. my body's falling apart because of it. <laughs> but hopefully uh, hopefully that, that keeps my mind you know, sane as well. So family, jujitsu? Yes. That's Anything else? That's really, that's really all that you need. Because family is, is not yeah. just you know, your personal family. It could be like uh, you know, relationships with, um, I, I consider kind of friends part of the family mm. as well. So basically your social life and some sort of personal pursuit outside of a career. Mm. I think for me, that's enough. Yeah, and there's not that much time either, right? Exactly. <laughs> Especially when you work 24 seven. Exactly. Where do you think the big blow up this cycle will come from? Big blow up the cycle. Because we talked with Dariel. I was mm. like, I like him because he's very critical and he's very on earth. He's also more of a trader. So he's like, mm -hmm. the traders in general, they're just more again, cynical and mm. like kind of on earth and maybe a bit pessimistic. But mm. So I was like, do you think an FTX or whatever, Luna or whatever is gonna happen again? He says, yeah, it's gonna happen again. There's gonna be a blow up, but at a much larger scale. Mm. Where do you think it comes from? Right now, I don't see a lot of uh, areas of, well, taking a step back here. I think usually big blow ups happen uh, when there's a lot of leverage, mm. especially if the leverage is hidden, where people can't see it, so they don't expect it to be coming. So this could happen more likely in opaque venues than in DeFi, where you can see everything on chain. Mm. Opaque venues as in centralized exchanges, uh, market makers, or uh, lending desks that are just over, uh, you know, over uh, under collateralized and uh, over rehypothecated to mm -hmm. very very risky counterparties, and this happens in TradFi every you know every few years you get a massive blow up. Right, Archegos recently, um, just exactly the same situation with uh, with 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 three AC as well. Just like borrow too much money, uh, too poor of a balance sheet, liquidity issues, and then just uh, cascading risk. So I think probably similar. Uh, I think one thing that I've learned about financial history is, uh, you know, things never repeat exactly the same, but they always rhyme. Mm. So one of the books that I'm reading right now is called Devil Takes the Hindmost. So it's about the history of financial speculation back to 1600s, all the way back to like the tulip mania. I read it. Yeah, so it talks it. about how uh, every single bubble is quite mm. similar, even though it's different, right? Sometimes it could be railroads, sometimes it could be tulips, but uh, there's always rhymes uh, within these, these bubbles and their subsequent blow ups. Just some examples of that book. I think it's a DJ and Spartan who like talked about this book, mm. 2021, I think something like that. Mm. He was like, if you don't want to get fucked this cycle, you should read this book. So yeah. I read the book, but I still got fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Different mileage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the English is a bit hard in this book. I remember I was mm. like, mm. Ah, it's because it's old, it's old kind of old yeah. English also, right? Mm, mm, mm. Uh, it's been written a long time ago, maybe like, 19, 20 or, or 30 or like, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. To have an, I mean, uh, you have an example of the book you want to talk about or? 
Are you far enough in the book to be able to talk about something? <laughs> I really, I really enjoyed that. The first part of the book, actually, about tulips. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people thought uh, tulip mania was like this massive, massive bubble, but it actually wasn't. It was a pretty localized bubble to like the Dutch market. Um, and I remember a funny anecdote from the book is that one of the speculators that got screwed so hard by the tulip bu uh, bubble, uh, he, every time he sees a tulip, he would kind of hit it with his cane after the bubble popped because he was like so mad at it. And that kind of reminds me of the public reaction to crypto these days. Because after FTX, after Luna, um, you can see the public reaction to crypto. The knee-jerk reaction is just negative. Right? Recently, there was a video of a guy giving a uh, valedictorian speech at, at a university, and he mentioned Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And the entire stadium of students was just booing him. So Recent video. Recent video. Maybe last month. Bullish. <laughs> Bullish. <laughs> Bullish. <laughs> yeah. So <coughs> I think there's uh, th there's always these kind of... Um, I mean, there's different reasons why cycles happen, right? So like uh, Howard Marks would talk about credit, uh, Ray Dalio would talk about credit expansion, Howard Marks talk about kind of market psychology, and then uh, Devil Takes the High Most talks about kind of manias. But regardless of the reason, I think the reaction on the way up and down seems to be quite similar across every th single thing. So that that is really fascinating to me. Mm. So we have to talk about something Actually, I was preparing this whole thing and I already had like content for, you know, two hours. But then I had this like light bulb moment last night and I was like, fuck, mm. I remember Jason wrote this thread that went viral. Uh oh, what is this? <laughs> How to get rich in crypto without getting lucky. Ah, yeah. And I was like, man, I, because for me, I, I listened to Naval Ravikant podcast, How to Get Rich Without Being Lucky in 2019. Mm. Mm. And I was already building businesses since years and investing, but this changed everything. Mm. How I run the businesses, how I invest, mm. because it's such a masterpiece, right? Mm. And I was like, I like this, I mean, the podcast that's based on the thread so much that now I remember Jason did something similar in crypto, which like went viral. So we need to talk about that. And I was even thinking yesterday, maybe we should do another podcast where we mm. just go just through, through the thread. Mm. And each, like he did with his three hours and a half podcast, right? Mm. And then you explain everything. Mm, mm, mm. So we can talk about that later, but like for the moment, I just like selected a few, I mean, actually 11 of them because it was hard, right? <laughs> yeah. And I would like you to explain them, right? So mm. just as a context, you wrote a th tweet thread in November, 2021, actually a few days before the Pico top of the <laughs> bull run. So the thread went viral. Mm. Um, so it started by, inspired by Naval's timeless thread. Here are some lessons from hundreds of conversations I had as an investor, as an interviewer on my podcast, Block Crunch, speaking to people in crypto who made it. The first one is be careful with confusing narratives with traction. Mm. The faster unearned value is accrued, the faster it will disappear. Yes. So I think with crypto, especially this cycle versus last time, is the over-focus on narratives. So with last cycle, meaning 2020 to 2021, um, a lot of that was driven by NFTs and DeFi and games as well. And with all three, all three of those categories, maybe with the slight exception of NFTs, there are metrics that mm -hmm. you can look into. So DeFi, people focus on, uh, you know, um, kind of loan origination for borrow, uh, for lending protocols. They focus on TVL. So a lot of fundamentals you can focus on. In this cycle, the most prominent asset is uh, is meme coins. And there's not much fundamentals to speak of. It's all kind of moving on narratives. Um, so that is something that I think is especially important for this cycle, for people to really figure out, okay, if you are investing in kind of a long time frame, if you have holding something for five years, working with the team, then you have to be careful not to fall for kind of narratives. If you're playing short-term games and trading, there's I don't think there's anything bad with that, but just be very honest what games you're playing. Um, I think this is also a common mistake by a lot of VCs, even big ones, is they see uh, metrics 
pile up on a protocol. Maybe because users are airdrop farming and they think, hey, that this is you know hockey stick growth, right? This is like in Web two when you see a hockey stick, you're supposed to invest. In crypto, oftentimes you get a hockey stick that completely re- reverses. So being able to think from first principles about what's driving usage here is it just short term speculation? Is it anticipation of an airdrop, or has this protocol actually tapped into something uh, that they can retain over years? Is probably the number one most important lesson for any investor. Do you think that, because it's, I understand the theory, right? But in practice, it's extremely hard. You're thinking, hey, I invested in Lido, for example. Amazing protocol, mm. great revenue. Like, but the, the freaking token is not performing well, right? Mm. I mean, actually, we talked about that with Alex. He came back second time on the podcast a few months ago, and we we're just talking about how he was saying fundamentals almost seems bearish in crypto because mm. they put a ceiling to what's possible. Mm. So you end up in this kind of weird world where you should be looking for fundamentals, at least if you look at you know the, w- the way to invest in traditional finance. Mm. But it doesn't work. <laughs> and oh, you, your your argument is maybe in five words, it's going to work, but like, who wants to wait fucking five years? Yeah, I think there's two. For, like, <laughs> so it's very important that uh, to know that there's two parts of this. So one is identifying fundamentals and growth, mm. um, but that, that doesn't necessarily make the asset an instant buy just because it has great growth and, and uh, fundamentals because there is such a thing as a bad price for a good asset. I don't think there's such a thing as a good price for a bad asset. If it's a really bad team, mm. really bad product, very cheap, I'm not going to buy it. But there are many cases where there are great protocols, you know, growing amazingly, but the market has already priced it in. Mm. So that's why alpha is so hard to find, right? It's not just about, hey, let's find a chart that goes this way and then let's just buy. Otherwise, everyone would make money. It's about finding that, but also a price that has not priced that in yet. That's where the hard part comes in. Did you read the Kobe's article from last night? So oh, yeah. oh, okay, because you really, I mean, we'll talk about that later about, you know, current venture state investing, high FDV. Now it's like a big yeah. thing in, on Twitter, Yeah, the high FDV low float, but actually he wrote an entire article. So I read it last time at like 1 a.m. because I was like, maybe you're going to talk about it tomorrow. So I was like, and he actually talks about that. You might have amazing, the entire price discovery happens in uh, uh, private markets now, mm. which is a big problem. Mm. He gives some examples. He gives ETH, SOL optimism mm. and the star, uh, stark uh, the stark token basically stark, yeah, yeah. right and t shows i mean you you i think you should read it today you probably will read it mm. today and uh, he explains that like the concept is basically he explains a lot of things but one of them is even if you think something is really amazing you should be patient because it might not be the right price, right? Mm. Because of different factors. Mm, mm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think a lot of these lessons are very, very apparent to the TradFi guys, right? Like the, the entire concept of margin of safety that Warren Buffett's talk about all the time is exactly this. It's like how uh, how much has this premium been priced in already and how much further it can go down? Mm. Um, I don't think crypto guys really understand that. So that's also where the alpha comes in. It's because it's such an inefficient market that these basic lessons still are being grasped by the market that you know, guys like me, barely with any TradFi experience, can come in and, and make a killing mm. on the markets because we're able to see this alpha. I do think this will go away. Like every cycle, it's already getting harder. Um, so I think this is probably going to self-correct as well. The second tweet I really liked was, if you're helpful to enough people over time, you will have, to, you will have access to wealth creation opportunities. You don't need to be a coder to add value. Made me feel good about it. (laughs) Content, network, thoughtful feedback are some other ways. Yeah. So one of the most important KBIs I try to drive on the venture side for Tension is founder referrals. Right. So how many introductions is this founder willing to give me? How many testimonials is this founder willing to give me? So for instance, if I want to invest in this team, because capital is so competitive, everybody knows that venture seems to be an easy game now. So everybody wants to fight for the same allocation. So in order to win out, we need to be able to show this founder that, hey, we've helped these guys before and this is what they have to say about us. So to to get that, you can't just put in money, right? You need to really be in the trenches with the founders, help them navigate very sticky conversations um, and just be extremely helpful. And that's the entire kind of angel investing slash venture business, I think. It's really just building your reputation as someone who's helpful. Um, so it's not just about kind of tweeting thoughtful things and building a followers. Uh, it, it's about kind of building those personal relationships and actually helping people 
you know, onboard TVL, helping people close senior hires, helping people onboard investors, helping people navigate legal nightmares. A lot of the things that you only really know how to do if you've been in the space and seen enough disasters uh, over the years. Don't get in the way of compounding. Hopping between projects every six months is bad and will destroy your reputation. Treat your job opportunities as investments because they are. Yeah, so my style of investing is very much, I like to buy what I have conviction in and I like to hold it. And the lower it goes, I want to buy more, right? And I think over time, I've actually learned this from Darrow, is that there's another way of compounding, which is going from the fastest horse to the next fastest horse to the next fastest horse. You can compound in both ways. Both are very, very different games. It's just that the former is more of my strength and my style. Um, and I think that also applies better for, uh, for from, from a job perspective, right? From people who are either accruing equity in a fund or working in a project, if you change every six months, you never allow that compounding to actually happen. Mm -hmm. And it's not like a liquid market where you can just like, uh, you know, buy a position and cash out and then flip it because with company equity, they need to vest over years. So if you give up your vesting within like the first year and then you go work for the next company because you think, hey, this thing might launch a token soon, doesn't work out, you go to the next, mm -hmm. then, you know, five, six years from now, you're gonna look back and wonder, hey, everybody who's early enough and had the balls to bet on this space seem to have made it, why am I still sitting here? Mm. Um, so I think that that's a common kind of thing that I, I notice in, in younger people as well. So there is your approach and then there is the Daryl approach, right? The Daryl approach probably most people can't play it. It's too hard, right? Because you're going to be too late to the narrative and you're going to get, for example, as, an in, as, a, as a trader or as a short-term investor, you're probably going to get wrecked, right? Because people who are smarter than you are there before. So I tend to be also closer to your approach. The problem is when do you cut the loss or when do you, uh, there is sometimes where you just need to realize mm. everything makes sense here, but <laughs> it's not working. Mm. <laughs> Like, yeah, I think that's- Because that's, of this narrative problem that is mm. even bigger this cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the moment you just say, the job is kind of different because the job like you're involved every day and but like as an investment like mm. when do you say okay like now i need to lower my ego and just accept that i was wrong right yeah so i think with it, it's different for venture as well so for venture what i mean is private investments right mm. investments where you're locked up for years so average lock up for our investments i think is four years mm. so we're forced to hold anyway and we don't flip, flip safs right i know some investors do this right they invest in a uh, portfolio they tell the founder hey we're gonna give the world to you we're gonna help you build so much and then two months later they sell this after somebody so we don't do that so for that type of investments it's really zero or 100x mm. but you really ride or die with the investor the thesis doesn't play out it goes to zero you suck it up you move on to the next that's part and parcel of the venture business now on the liquid side if you're buying a token on binance uh, for every single position that we buy at tangent we have a very disciplined approach to invalidation so there's two ways to invalidate uh, usually one is a thesis invalidation. Either the thesis hasn't played out, usually that's a factor of time. So let's say six months, if you look at uh, similar companies or protocols in the past, six months is usually how long they need to really reach escape velocity or nothing at all. Then you give it six months to play out. It's not an exact science, obviously. Number two is price, which is my l less favorite a less favored uh, invalidation, which is the price has dropped down so much, this is the max pain you're willing to take on this position and you have to cut it and re-underwrite. So that's when you become a forced seller. So very an ideal situation, but I think um, quite necessary for proper risk management. In Kobe's article yesterday, there is actually an example that I think Solana, the 2018 it was four cents, right? Private rounds, mm. 26 million, something like that. But you could still have bought it in May, 2020 mm. for 50 cents. Mm. But he was still saying, hey, like the token went down 50% before ripping 500X, right? Mm. So in that case, you would probably, 50% is probably a big pain that you might cut and then miss out on like gigantic upside, right? Mm. It's very hard. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. very hard. It's it is not. A, it's not an exact science, right? Yeah. Um, and there are many cases where people are forced to sell the lows. Um, so that comes back to the margin of safety, right? Also, kind of your buffering. Like if you're already levered before the fifty percent drawdown, then there's no kind of buffer for you to buy in more. 
Mm. So kind of that that's where the portfolio management part of the uh, of the job comes in. That I think a lot of investors, especially retail investors, don't understand. Right? They they kind of I think that the average retail investor, at least for me, when, when I first started, I was like, oh, this coin is good. This coin good, let's put money in. Right? I was looking at Walton Chain, oh, this thing's gonna change supply chain, let's put all my money in. There's no concept of portfolio management, of risk management, of invalidation, of price targets, uh, of re-underwriting. So all of those concepts are already perfected in TradFi. So I think a lot mm. of crypto people, they're, they scoff at TradFi. They think, oh, they're boomers, they don't understand crypto. Yeah. But you don't look to TradFi guys for the crypto insight, but right? you look to them for the frameworks they've mastered over the t- past like 200, 300 years. So that's something that we try to borrow as well from kind of TradFi institutions. Don't avoid volatility. Volatility is the price you pay for outsized compounded returns. Yeah, I think a lot of people in crypto, I, I remember there was this Twitter thread by one of the hosts of a, of a popular crypto podcast, and he's a oil trader. Um, and then he talked about how being a crypto trader is the worst decision you can make for your career because you will never be able to actually compound your portfolio because you always hit your risk limits. Um, so I mm. think he arrived at this. So this, this guy is, is not like a nobody, right? He's a big oil commodities trader. Um, but I think he reached a conclusion because he's applying TradFi risk parameters to a crypto. So this is one example where you actually cannot just blindly borrow uh, TradFi frameworks. So if you assume that crypto has similar volatility as equities, you're going to be cutting everything at 30% drawdowns. But every month we have like a 30% drawdown in something. So you have to adjust your risk for the volatility of crypto, not just from a portfolio perspective, but just from a career perspective, right? You have to fully expect that because of how cyclical it is, in the good times, people take it way too far. In the bad times, people also take it way too far. So can you withstand two years of maybe like very, very low minimum pay if you're at a Mm. protocol and expectations of maybe no upside at all. Um, and the only way you can withstand this is if you have proper risk management across your life, but also if you have strong enough of a conviction. But if you don't even believe in this protocol, you're only in it because you think they might launch a token soon, I could make a big buck off this, you're not gonna make it in the next three, four years. Absolutely. Conviction, absolutely. Extremely important point. And then the other one is very interesting because anyone who's involved in crypto especially I would say full-time or near full-time, whether you're building a business or you're an investor, whatever, you should understand that, hey, the moment everything goes up is the moment you start to stack some cash for the next bear market, which will inevitably happen. Because if you have a podcast and you have sponsors, the sponsor will disappear cool. overnight, exactly, right? Exactly. If yeah. you are a trader and you get wrecked, the money will disappear overnight, right? If you if you have a fund, people, no one will want to invest anymore if it's not your own money. Mm. So like there is these cycles that it's really easy to forget when everything goes well, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Half of getting rich is staying rich. Don't upgrade your lifestyle to match your paper wealth after historic bull run. This is so good. <laughs> this yeah. is so good. You see there's a lot in crypto where uh, I always find the wealth flexing thing to be incredibly um, cringe. Right? People are just flexing, hey, I got this watch, I got these cars and stuff. Um, so I actually quite enjoy this new trend that I saw this cycle, which is people flexing wealth. Right? People just showing, hey, this is my resting heartbeat. This is mm. like my squat. This is my max deadlift. I actually quite enjoy that. Mm. Um, but I think the bigger point is if you make, let's say, a million, $5 million on paper from your venture bets, none of which is vested and monetized, and you start spending like you have $5 million in the bank, that's how you go broke. Mm. And it happens a lot, not just in crypto, with athletes. Where the reason why so many professional athletes go broke is because uh, they spend like they actually have that in cash. But after paying the managers, after accounting for illiquidity, they actually don't have that much cash left. And I, I see so many of these interviews with like pro athletes talking about their financial troubles. Um, that, that I think it applies to crypto as well. The flexing of the wealth, I thought a lot about it because I had a lot of people I, I'm not super close to, but I spend a lot of time with who are like that. Mm. The chain, I felt like I was with a bunch of rappers, right? (laughs) Like literally (laughs) I flex all the watches, I flex the chain, I flex all that stuff. And I just, for me, I was just more thinking it's probably because they come from a place where they had almost no money growing up. Mm. So from a place of insecurity, oh, mm. now I just kind of made it, I need to show it. Mm. Right? Obviously you go through a cycle, you get wrecked, 
Mm. And then you realize <laughs> it's for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna flex that much anymore because yeah. <laughs> there's not much to be flexed, right? Yeah. And also you I think getting wrecked is really important because it kind of uh like it grounds you and makes you understand what's important in life, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And yeah. no one gives a fuck about your watch or your chains anyway. Yeah. So like, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is again, a really cool thing in Singapore. Like when I do these dinners and I realize, I don't know, in the room there is maybe probably a couple of billion dollars no one has a freaking watch. Mm. If they have a watch, it's an Apple watch. So like literally, <laughs> it's an Apple watch. And I'm like, or Garmin, right? And mm. I'm like, this says something, right? Yeah. About the kind of people, mm. they just understand that this is not the thing, right? Mm. Or they've been through the cycle of uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. getting wrecked enough. Yeah. Um, this is the best one. Don't bet what you don't have to win what you don't need. Yes, uh, that is a comment on mostly on leverage, but also on risk management again. I think most of the tweets in this thread are about some sort of risk management, right? So with this, I think I was specifically referring to funds that were constantly levering up in order to chase that return. But if you look at the volatility of crypto, it's already one of the highest vol asset classes in the world. You rarely have a very liquid asset that goes up three, four, five X uh, multiple years through mm -hmm. a cycle, right? So if you already have the volatility, the worst thing you can do is blow yourself up before you get to compound and enjoy that upside. Uh, but I think greed gets the better of everybody. And there's so many big funds, even some of the heroes of last cycle, the, the CT main characters that just blew up from mm -hmm. leverage alone. What do you mean by what you don't need? Nobody needs a billion dollars in cash. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> it's completely true. But so where does it come from? Like It's just like this competition of... Who is the best? Who is the biggest? Insecurity? I think a lot of it is, I think beyond a certain point uh, of money, people are in it for the game, right? Are in it for the challenge, which mm -hmm. I totally understand and respect. Um, but there's also differentiation that comes from skill, where you are, you, are, you are objectively a better venture investor. You are objectively a better trader. And differentiate that comes from leverage, where you might be the same skill level, but your outcomes are magnified because of leverage. So on the way up, you look like you're doing better. On the way down, you're doing a lot worse. So people who don't have this skill might want to supplement that with leverage, and then they always find out, right? So there's the, there's the, there's the, there's the meme, fuck around and find out. So they yeah. fucked around and they find out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they find out in a bear market, always. <laughs> Actually, it reminds me of the conversation with Arthur again, because he was saying, man, like these guys, you think they're gods, but then you just realize that all their fame came from leverage and mm. uh, and doing illegal shit, basically. Mm -hmm. And you put that together in the right timing is like amazing. And then you, you find <laughs> out later. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but it's very hard because you have, it's very hard because you feel you, I mean, you, for example, me, I was doing very well in last, but I felt I was fucking poor all the time because I see these dudes. I mean, there's the, the classic tweet, like the meme mm. tweet of uh, Su uh, Suzu, uh, $50 million is not going to buy you a reasonably sized house or something mm. like that. Mm. And then you're like, what the fuck? Like, you know, you start to question yourself. And also you see all these traders and these people who are flexing p &Ls and often it's com a complete lie. Mm. It's a lie. Mm. Or you, and also because of our own insecurity, we always think that people make more than they actually make. Mm. We do. Mm. So, okay, some people do amazingly well until they don't, right? Or they do amazingly well, great. But like if they do amazingly well, probably they got wrecked before and learned some stuff, right? But it's very hard because you see all these people flexing things and numbers and starting to tell you that 50 million is nothing or 10 million is nothing, right? It's probably mm. gonna happen again this cycle. Mm. 10 million is nothing, 1 million is nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And then it makes you start, you're doing amazing, but it makes you make the wrong decisions mm. that ends you getting wrecked when you based your kind of judgment on some lies online. So nothing makes sense, mm. right? 
Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. so stupid, and it's it's a waste. Like it's just terrible. Like I don't know. <laughs> so, and it's gonna happen again. Especially yeah, especially for for traders and people who participate in liquid markets. I think the best thing you can do is actually just meet more people and read more. Right? Mm-hmm. If you read about uh, kind of the people who really succeeded in your field in you know in TradFi, for instance you realize actually this comparison game is useless because if you're comparing yourself to a fund or a guy who has $50 million, he's comparing himself to a guy with $100 million, uh. $200 million. <laughs> and then you zoom out and you look at the TradFi guys, like the billionaires, uh, $1 billion in cash just from like running massive hedge funds and institutions. Like you realize that there's always, there's a saying in Chinese, right? There's uh, always a higher mountain. So no matter how big of a man you think you are, you are nothing. There's always a mountain that's bigger. So I think this self-comparison is, is really terrible for performance. But internally, me and Daryl, uh, we still kind of playfully compare ourselves to other funds just to keep it kind of competitive. But we know like we're never going to make decisions based on where we are relative to other people. Are you able to not compare yourself to each other? Well, I think we have struck a really good partnership where we kind of grow the pot, wolf pack mm. type of a mentality. So mm. we don't really care who's bringing in the food at what point mm. in time, as long as we are both kind of doing our jobs. <laughs> We talked about leverage, obviously. So there's one good about leverage. Do not mistake leverage for genius. You hear stories of people brag about making eight or nine figures within a year. They tend to be quiet when they lose it all in one day. There are so many stories like this. <laughs> and I wrote this when only uh, the, when the up only was happening, when people were yeah. talking about the eight, nine figures yeah. wins. Nobody yeah. has talked about losses yet because the losses haven't happened. Yeah. <laughs> and then 12 months after this tweet, I think maybe half the people who are flexing the wealth have lost it all. Just like completely went back to zero, right? So I think that is just human nature, right? If you combine availability of leverage, how easy it is to borrow money with a highly volatile asset class, you basically just get casino on steroids. So it, it's my least favorite part of crypto. I understand why it happens. I respect, you know, I respect the game, but it's not something that I participate in. And I try to encourage If there's one financial advice I give to my friends, it's like, don't fucking lever up and trade crypto. Don't do it. <laughs> Just don't do it. So you say, I understand what happens. Can you explain why? Because it, the, the, the basics are so simple. It's a, it's a high volatility asset class, mm. right? You know, even I think BTC, 70, 80 vol, right? Asset, mm. the rest much bigger, right? Yes. Yeah. So if you... I think put it in simple terms. If you 10x leverage, if the asset goes down 10%, your entire account is wiped. Exactly. So you, you, so, you so limit your, uh, how much you're able to buffer risk the more you lever up. So why would people, if they really understand, because I don't think the majority of people are dumb, right? Why, if they understand that you can make, if you enter in the bear market in a top coin, mm. let's think about March crash. You get ETH. Mm. You up 50x on the second largest coin. I mean, mm. who is going to get the bottom and tell the top? Fine. But mm. like you have a 50x upside mm. on the lar- second largest coin. Mm. You don't need leverage. Mm. <laughs> you don't need it. Why do people lever- you lever up? You said you understand them. Yeah, it's pure greed, right? They want, it, it's kind of up, one upsmanship. They want to beat the other fund, right? If this fund is long the same asset in the same size, they're going to perform the same. So the only way we can win is either we find more alpha, but we can't. So let's lever up on the same coin. And people always talk about, oh, this thing has gone up X percent or 50X, but they never talk about what it took to get there. In every single 50X, there's often multiple 50% drops. And if you're anything above 2X leverage, you're completely wiped yep. out. So I think leverage only makes sense in high sharp scenarios. High sharp as in your strategy has been known to produce low volatility relative to the returns or high Sortino scenarios where your strategy has proven to produce low kind of downside volatility relative to upside. Uh, But even then, right, if you're you're using past data to justify future decisions, nobody ever saw May 2021 coming. Nobody saw, what some people saw FTX coming. Um, So, I think in an asset class with this much volatility, most directional and discretionary strategies should not be levering uh, significantly. Yeah. And if you look at it, there is at least once a year a mega leverage flush. Mm. At least, yeah. if not twice, right? So you will, if you're more, 
if you're levered more than 2x, you're gonna get wrecked. Yeah, yeah. And for example, March crash, I lost 80% of my net worth. Mm. I was levered two or three X on ETH, but mm. I just didn't have time to do anything, right? And mm. just got completely wrecked. Mm. So there, and it's not, oh, it's a black swan. No, it's not. Mm. Like, yes, but no, in crypto every year, every, everyone who is levered gets killed. Yeah. yeah. Like, so <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think you probably have to go there and lose it all to understand and accept it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Beware of Dunning Kruger effect just because someone made it by being early in crypto does not mean they're equipped to opine, opine, opine on cryptography, macroeconomics, politics, etc. Yeah, I think there's a lot of talking hunts in crypto. I think sometimes I am an offender of this as well. I talk about things I don't fully understand, so I try not to. <laughs> but I think people, because money is such an objective. Uh, it's such a widely consensus metric of success that a person who has more mm. money than the next person, they often think I'm a better person than you. I know more than you, but that's often not true, especially in crypto when the sources of wealth can be dubious sometimes. So when people start listening to someone just because they have more money or social status or more Twitter followers, I think that could often lead them to ruin. When I see this, I don't want to get political, but I remember during the protests in Hong Kong, there were a lot of takes from people who I don't think has even been to Hong Kong before, opining on the politics of Hong Kong and China and all that stuff. And uh, I was just like, yeah, this is, as someone who was living in Hong Kong at the time, none of the stuff that these guys were talking about were playing out. And that happens in crypto as well, where people just opine on macroeconomics um, or you know geopolitics. And because the curation of signals is so bad in crypto, there's no kind of macroeconomists or uh, macro guys that are accomplished that are focused only on crypto. So people tend to follow crypto guys who talk about macro. And I think that you, you could also get wrecked by listening to these guys. So curate your signals is probably the succinct way to summarize this. Do you want to explain Dunning-Kruger effect? Dunning-Kruger effect is when somebody thinks they have more expertise in a topic than they actually do. <laughs> and it happens a lot in crypto. I remember in 2018, 19, I went to San Francisco for a conference and this guy introduced himself as a blockchain expert. He shook my hand. He's like, hey, I'm a blockchain expert. I can advise any companies that you guys have. And then I don't know, oh, what do you think about uh, uh, the, the Bitcoin Bitcoin Cash fork? And he was like, ah, the what? So ah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, it's not even like he has, a, he has an opinion on everything and he's certain he's right. He's like plain, not aware of a bunch of stuff. He just and doesn't know just what's going on. And I think that probably <laughs> happens more than we think in crypto. Right. I had the CMO of Avalanche mm. on the podcast, but like that was probably almost a year ago. And you are saying the most important thing to understand in crypto is nobody knows shit. <laughs> nobody like knows literally, anything. like yeah. nobody knows shit. Like people think they know some things yeah. and everything, but like they just like they don't know, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's probably exactly. the the, the exactly. <laughs> safest uh, the safest play here. Crypto runs on narratives. Narratives are crafted by people. Mm. People always have an agenda. Mm. If you can't find the fish at the table, you are the fish. Yes. So <laughs> I think that's pretty self-explanatory. I think every, because <laughs> of the lack of consensus around valuation models, uh, it's happening in equities as well, but, but, but for crypto, uh, a lot of things just run on narratives, right? Who's, who, like, who, who's talking about what assets and a lot of these people might even be, you know, living in the same place, right? So I think there are stories of just a bunch of crypto traders living in like Puerto Rico and they all just kind of, you know, organize these narratives together. So you never know. <laughs> right? I'm not saying that that's actually happening, but I'm sure there's elements of crypto where a bunch of the big accounts are coordinating on pushing a narrative to seem like it's a decentralized uh, uh, a narrative, but it's really just coordinated. So be very careful playing narrative games is probably my, my, my takeaway from this. Um, and it ties back to the earlier tweet about unearned value, right? Just because something seems to be taking off in price in user counts, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be here to stay. So there's a very big difference between hockey sticks in crypto and hockey sticks in Web2. Usually, if you capture a hockey stick in Web2, maybe 50-50, it is something. Uh, there are some exceptions, like with, uh, we were talking about this before we recorded, uh, that, that application that took off in covid a clubhouse. Clubhouse. Right. Yeah. It massively took off. Every, well, yeah. Everyone thought it would be the future of media, but yeah. it, it wasn't. Yeah. So there are cases like that. But in general, 
I think there's a lot more duds with crypto hockey sticks where you see, oh, user count just like 20x uh, this past year. It must be something. And then a year later, you check back. It's like. Pfft. How do you differentiate between a narrative and something that's going to stay? If we take meme coins, for example, mm. it's a big narrative, this cycle. Mm. But it kind of, I mean, Dogecoin is there for 10 years plus. Mm. Last cycle, there was already like some, a few doing really well. So there is things that seem to be something that could be like a good narrative for a cycle, but also mm. are played out in the longer term and become something that's bigger, right? Mm. I think in general, there are three things that I look for in terms of whether a hockey stick translates into retention. So number one is death defying. Right, if something is supposed to die, but it doesn't die, it probably is here for a reason. There's probably people supporting this that I'm not aware of. Um, so like examples are things like Ethereum Classic, right? It should be gone forever, but it's still a relatively valuable protocol for some reason, um, especially after the 55, uh, 51% mm -hmm. attack a few years ago. So there are many, many examples of this where things should have died, but they didn't. And then I think number two is actual retention numbers. This only applies to specific verticals. So for instance, for social, I think A16Z, the Web2 fund, has done a study on uh, retention for social protocols where uh, above a certain threshold uh, for the percentage of users that you retain after 30 days, it probably captures lightning in a bottle. So for instance, by the 30th day, I think Snapchat retained like 30% of their user cohort. That's a really good number. Facebook was like 40%, Instagram similar. So there are numbers that you can look for. And then third is just Lindy, right? How long has this thing been around? So I think meme coins as a category has a lot of Lindy already, right? Since 2017, we already have meme coins. Specific, specific meme coins, um, there's actually not that many that has ex kind of reached escape velocity, right? If you look at meme coins that stayed around cycle after cycle, it's really Doge and Sheep right now, mm. maybe Pepe as well. But most of the new ones, they have very, very kind of short half-life. Mm. So I'm pretty confident meme coin as a category has Lindy, specific names, not so much. So those are the three mm. things that kind of need to check the box before I think, okay, this will be sticking around. Paid forward. The space is young and you never know where favors can pay off. People who refuse to hop on a call with me when I started out now want my advice. Yeah, so there's a lot of examples of uh, people who help each other, I think, in crypto. Like my angel career was completely started because uh, my friend Tom Schmidt from Dragonfly mm. referred a deal to me. Uh, it was one inch. So my first ever angel check. Um, and then that was that's taught me everything about angel investing because uh, after he introduced me, I thought, okay, that's done. Like I just write a check here, but actually I still had to fight for it. I had to like pitch to the founder. It was a whole long process. So it taught me everything that I needed to know about winning an angel deal, but I would not have seen that deal if Tom didn't introduce the founders to me in the first place. And he just did that out as a favor. Um, so I realized actually this is a favors game, right? You just kind of try to help people without expectation of returns and you try to plant karma everywhere. Mm. Um, the, the converse is also true, right? A lot of people are takers. So not to quote Adam Grant too many times, but he wrote a book about give and take, about two types of people, givers and takers. And I think his conclusion is that matchers, people who give and take, are people who tend to progress the furthest, have the best personal relationships. Um, but in crypto, there's a lot of takers. They only try to take things from you. They try to kind of get deals from you. They try to get alpha from you, never give anything back. I think those people tend to not do so well over the long term. That's a good one for me. I'm a pure giver. And I don't know if it's because of my Swiss roots. Like in Switzerland, you don't, you don't want to bother. So you don't ask, mm. right? Mm. You say, I mean, Adam Grant says, people who do the best are the givers and takers, right? Mm. How likely is it for you because crypto is this weird thing where in bear market, you you do stuff, but like no one really has, you know, money or like it's not, not, not much happens. It's where there is the best deals, but like you need to find them and things are slow. People don't really believe in crypto. And then very quickly, at some point, like within a month or two, kind of the bull is back mm. and then no one has bandwidth. It's like a complete chaos, right? Mm. And you might feel like, oh man, now I'm giving. Again, you don't have expectation of return, so whatever. But like, if I don't go out there a bit and say, hey, I also want something, mm. 
nothing might happen mm. because even the ones who are who you're giving to like it, they, they just have no bandwidth like they're just like completely underwater mm, mm. what's That's your approach or what was your approach to that saying hey like i'll just give 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 or i'll be like hey now i need to also show that uh i'm here guys <laughs> yeah, yeah i think uh with, with the podcast for instance right i i really did it for two years just by myself and i didn't get much out of it but then you know it got me my first job Mm. Right, it got me noticed by by Kelvin, my former boss. So I do think that as long as you're putting out enough kind of effort out there, eventually you can kind of, you know, monetize some of these things. Um, but if you're constantly kind of evaluating, hey, can I monetize this now? How much can I get out of this mm. relationship? Then people can sense it. I think Absolutely. people can ses- sense falseness if you're trying to calculate every relationship. This is something I see as a cultural divide as well. I think in, in, in Chinese business, they t- always talk about guanxi, they always talk about relationships. But I think there's like people who actually treat these relationships as something to cultivate over years before they fire the clip. So I, I've seen funds that talk to people for years and years and years before they bring them on. So they literally just plant the seeds for 10 years before they, they've closed to the hire. And then some people who just kind of, hey, can I add your, your WeChat? And then instantly they ask you for things, right? So I think people can sense what type of relationship you're trying to build mm. and your mileage will vary based on what you get. Last one. Last one, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> the wild volatility in crypto can create and destroy wealth in a very short time. Every cycle you hear stories of exuberant wealth, but also people who ended it all. Always know what is important to you and what is enough. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of dark stories in crypto. I mean, even in Mm -hmm. in TradFi as well. As with any high stakes career, there's people who can't remove or or lose sight of what is truly important, right? Kind of their net worth becomes their self-worth. So when you lose your net worth, you feel like you're not worth anything and you just kind of end it all. So I've, I've heard... Some people kind of in my proximity as well who, who kind of just like killed themselves, right, in, in bear markets. So that is something that I think is not really a crypto thing as much as it is a human thing mm. to really realize what your worth is. And I mean, I'm 29 years old. Like, what the fuck do I know, right? But I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out as well. Um, and it comes back to the, to the topic about having stability in your life, right? You don't need that many anchors. You really don't need that many things that make your life meaningful. You just need two or three very, very deep things. And also I would add, you don't need that much money. No, yeah. Like there is a point after which, I mean, yeah, you need to have breakfast. I mean, I do intermittent fasting, so I don't have breakfast, but like (laughs) what, you need to have lunch. How Mm. much is a clean lunch? If you eat Mm. clean, right? Or how much is a clean dinner? Or like, yeah, sometimes you can go a bit crazy on holiday, but again, Singapore is an expensive place, but still like you don't need that much. Yeah, I think there's a, I mean, there's an element of like just rich guys talking about money is not useful, but obviously. Uh, I mean, when you have it, it's uh, easier to, to say that it's not useful, right? Yes, yes. But <laughs> I think that the biggest thing with money is I realize it, it, I, I'm not a big spender, but it's the biggest anxiety alleviator. I'm yeah. a very anxious person. Yeah. I'm always very paranoid about things or health and all that stuff. And I, I, I have many family members close to me who need to spend a lot of money on medical treatments and stuff like that. So having that buffer actually takes it off your mind, right? You know, okay, if I, if my body gets fucked up in some way, I know I can pay for this. Yeah. That is actually the, the biggest untalked about, uh, I guess, benefit of money. It's, 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 it's not so much, oh, I can buy this. I can flex this. It's more just like, I don't have to worry, right? I think that that is the one thing that um, I think makes it worth it. But then beyond that certain point, it's all optional. I think you don't really need that much. Where do you think your anxieties are coming from? You said I'm a very anxious person on different things. I think, well, I think my, my, my upbringing was in Hong Kong. So it's a deeply, deeply cutthroat and competitive local school environment. Mm. Um, so you're kind of always looking for edge here and there, always trying to look for your deficiency. So there's an element of that. That actually lends itself very well to survival in crypto because you're always trying to figure out, okay, you know, can this thing blow up and screw me? Can this thing screw me this way? Um, so it's negative, but it's also positive. For example, I would argue, yeah. People, some people think, oh, the day I have a million dollar or mm. I have a ten million dollar, whatever, I, I, I'm free, I'm chill. Mm. I always say, fuck no. Like, especially when you know that it can go away so quickly, right? Mm. You will always be. 
yes, okay, if I fall sick, I can pay whatever, but like you will, you always need to have a healthy level of anxiety mm. because the day you lose this, you're going to lose everything because it's going to yeah. go away. Someone is going to take it from you, right? Yeah. So yeah. there is no such life, at least I would say as a, okay, maybe it's a bit more traditional, traditionalist, but as a man who's going to have a family, mm. you're probably going to be stressed all your life mm. because you don't want to fuck up and being stressed out like is positive because it's the only way for you to stay safe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, cortisol is a, <laughs> it, it's not a inherently negative hormone, right? It, it, it's positive in that it helps you stay away from uh, from actual risks yeah. uh, or from, from actual danger. So I think if your anxiety is so much that it gets in the way of risk taking, then it's, uh, it's a problem. And, you know, I'll be the first to admit, I, I hate trading. I do not like to look at charts and look at my PL every day. It stresses me out. It forces me to make bad decisions. So I don't do it, uh, that. So for a fund to do well, you don't actually need uh, to be good at everything. You just need to attract the people who are great at those things and maybe bad at things that you are and then build a team around, uh, you know, just different aspects of the game. So for instance, for Tangent, right? So I think there was more of the kind of liquid markets trader guy. He loves it. Yeah. I hate it. And then he yeah. he <laughs> is not as much of the kind of sit down with a founder and talk for four hours kind of thing. And I enjoy that kind of just brainstorming with founders and so on. So finding what aspects of the game gives you stress and try to kind of delegate that and then find aspects of the game that gives you fulfillment and inherently makes you uh, better at that game, I think is is one of the more hidden alphas that I've discovered uh, since starting Tangent as well. Probably the hidden alpha for any type of business, right? Crypto or non-crypto. Yeah, I basically. think so. I think so. You have pretty strong views on the current problems in crypto venture investing. Venture investor, yeah. I mean, now everybody's discussing on Twitter, right? Yeah, so we talked, actually, since a couple of days, it's crazy, right? Mm. But you've been talking about that already for a while. Yeah, I've talked about that since last cycle, mm. right? I think the it, it's not really VC's problem. I think people vilify VCs a lot. Uh, so let me explain what the problem is first. So oh. basically now, uh, there are a lot of VC funds that have overraised. They're too big. There's too much money chasing the amount of deals. So let's call it, maybe there is $200 million worth of seed stage companies that need to be funded, but there's $20 billion fighting for this. So how do you deploy the $20 billion? You either jack up the valuation so high that you can throw in bigger checks so that 200 million becomes 500 million. So you bake in a bigger premium before they launch, uh, or you just get better as a venture investor and try to dominate the whole round, in which case you concentrate cap tables. So because of this financial dynamic, uh, a lot of protocols are listing at a very, very high price versus 2017 ICOs when everybody could participate. So now retailers can only buy a protocol at like a billion dollars after listing. So for a protocol to go from $10 million to a billion dollars, it's much easier than $10 billion to like a trillion dollars. Right? It's the same multiple, but it, it's, it's mm. a ma order of magnitude harder. So I think that has warped the perception of opportunity in crypto, which is why people are going to meme coins because every time they buy like a tier one L1 or a new app, they're constantly just buying very highs. Even if the token does well, the upside is limited versus you know a new coin that there's no overhang, no VCs in. So I don't think that it's like an existential problem. I think this thing will overcorrect because what it means is VCs returns will compress. If you're investing in more and more expensive protocols and fewer and fewer people are buying, in open markets, it means your returns go down. If your returns go down, LPs don't come in, your fund size shrinks, it resets. It just takes time. So I was, I've been talking about this reset since 2021, still hasn't happened. I do think within the next few years, we're gonna get some normalization in venture and that's where we go aggressive again. Yes, basically Suzu we tweeted two days ago, the high FDV came results from overfunding of infra relative to apps. Mm. The overfunding of infra result, result from the lower perceived regulatory risk and execution risk of infra versus apps. The solution to high FDV is for people to stop buying. Yes. This is already happening, so no further action needed. Correct, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> this is what I've been talking about for the past two years. It yeah. will happen. Um, and I say it's not completely the fault of the VCs. It's because the broader market is also supporting the valuations of the L1s, right? You have L1s that have like four users come to market and it's like $20 billion. Um, so it makes no sense. Why is that happening? Because you said the broader market, like maybe it's important for people to understand that there is, who are the key actors that are involved, especially in the 
private markets and then at kind of like the TG moment mm. and that are all incentivized for it to have a high FDV, right? Yeah, yeah. So founders obviously, or teams, uh, they, they want a more expensive protocol, mm. um, especially if for employees who, who have vesting tokens that they want it to be a sell at a higher, VCs the same. Exchanges also want uh, higher value protocols because usually they, they, they correlate with higher volumes, which means more revenues. Obviously, with investors, they have no other opportunity to buy, say, like Aptos and Pre-Seed. So that's why they must buy Aptos on Binance, right? So there's a lot of factors that contribute to people buying L1s. I think it all traces back to 2018 uh, for FAT protocols, which is written by, uh, I think, Joel Monegro from Placeholder. Mm-hmm. He wrote a thesis about how in... Uh, in Web2, it's all about fat apps, where the application layer captures majority of the users and values. So like Facebook, Instagram, multi-billion yeah. dollar entities. Yeah. Uh, and then in crypto, it's fat protocols, where the protocols capture most of the value. Um, I think we started to see some refutation of this with things like Axie Infinity, where you have like 3 million daily active users last cycle, multi-billion dollar uh, app, really the first of its kind. And people started to doubt this, but because we didn't have another app that took off the same to the same extent that Axie had, people are now reverting back to fat protocols. And they're saying, oh yeah, protocols are going to worth $100 billion if they're successful versus an, versus an app is going to worth $10 billion. So given an option to buy both at $1 billion, I'm going to buy the protocol because the upside is higher. So I think that might not be a wrong thesis, mm. but it is contributing to the dynamic where everybody bits the infra. Yeah, who's going to build and who is going to build the apps? Exactly. There's, there's less incentives. I'll just, I'm just going to launch another layer one yeah, or another exactly. layer two, right? And there's also the market makers. Mm. We had a few of them here, like had the Alexis Yurka, co-founder of GSR, Johan from Wintermute. And even they kind of say like, if your protocol is not worth a hundred mil, mm. when it launches, we're not even going to take it. Yeah. Like it's not worth it. Exactly. So the whole thing is manufactured, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's actually the entire thesis for Tangent in the beginning is because we realize all of the players and stakeholders in the space are incentivized to really come in at a big enough size. There's no one taking care of founders at the time that they need the most care, which is the pre-seed seed stage when they're just starting. They have no idea who to talk to. They have no idea how to assemble a cap table. Who do I even reach out to people? Mm. And I thought, okay, why don't we why don't we raise a fund to uh, to take care, take care of these founders? And the Upside is higher as well. If you get early and you are right, you're investing in protocols at like five, ten million dollars. And then we did the math and we realized actually it doesn't make sense. If we raise too small of a fund, we can't even pay the pay pay our employees. So we thought, okay, whatever, let's just do prop uh, so that we have max flexibility. We can do really early stage if we want, but also do later stage if we want. Uh, so it was really a reaction to that that kind of led us to the start tangent. But you said before that you're usually the one grilling, right? And I don't grill people, but you still have, you're the you're the VC guy, right? Dario is more like the trader. Even yourself, you have this incentive to be like, ah, oh, I'm early in this protocol that launched at a 10 billion FDV. It's fucked, but I'm not really unhappy about it, right? Well, it depends because is it $10 billion today at listing? If it is, then it doesn't really matter to me because VCs care because they raise money off of paper marks, right? They, 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 before, well, a lot of them have to raise on DPI now, which is actual dollars return. But in the bull market, a lot of them can raise on paper marks alone. You invest in something at list at a 10X, even though you don't get to cash out in four years, they can say we have a 10X Mm. MOIC, uh, multiples on your invested capital. And then your investors will look at that and say, oh, this guy looks like he knows what he's doing. Oh. But for me, as prop capital, it doesn't really matter. MOICs don't pay for my lunch. Actual dollars return. So if it's $10 billion in four years, then I'm really happy. If it's $10 billion today, is that cool? But does, can it sustain this in four years? That is the bigger problem. Um, and you know, a lot of mm. things can happen in four years. And I don't think you can stay at a high valuation in the vicinity of like tens of billions of dollars for four years without actually shipping something, right? So for Solana, um, they're only able, like if Solana didn't have this many apps building on it, I don't think it will be where it is today. So in the first cycle, maybe it can run on narratives alone, but the second cycle, it required those massive airdrops from apps that people were actually using. So I think it aligns my 
incentives a little bit better in that I actually need this thing to succeed in four years versus just like, hey, let's hype this thing up and, and dump this shaft on somebody. You mentioned Solana. So first crazy cycle to $250, something like that. It wouldn't have come back without a lot of things happening on the chain, right? One of the things we mentioned a bit already, one of mm. the big things that happened on Solana is meme coins. Mm. What's your take on meme coins? Yeah, I have. Uh, so we actually got involved with meme coins before this meme mania. We invested in a project called Meme Land. And when I explained the thesis, I was like, oh, we just invested uh, in Meme Land. I remember a lot of my Twitter replies was like, oh, I didn't know you're a fucking scammer. I, <laughs> is it the tweet where you say in September 2023, we invested in meme land as one of our what the fuck bet of 2023. Yes, that's right. That's right. As a perennial meme coin skeptic and critic, I was initially dismissive. Mm. However, while nine gag CEO struck of record as someone who built uh, and operates one of the largest website in the world seems unknown to most in the West. It wasn't for a fellow Hong Konger. I saw the promise of creating an actual digital community meant to bring people to crypto, not the other way around, which is what we talked about before, right? Mm. It's not, it's not the masses, it's not bringing crypto to the masses, is crypto, uh, is the masses coming into crypto, right? Mm. And made an un uncharacteristic bet while it's still early days, Mimlan debuted as the largest Binance launch this year. Maybe you want to start with like, what is Mimland? Yeah. And why are you so bullish on the project built by the founder of 9gag? So Memeland is actually the token for a social community. Um, so it is it is portrayed as a meme coin, but it is really supposed to be a utility coin for a cluster of different projects with social use cases. So one of the projects is Stakeland, which is a free kind of liquid staking product. Uh, there's a few kind of NFT collections and a few other social products that the team is still building on that I don't think I can talk about yet. Um, and it's all supposed to transact with this meme uh, token. So uh, I get taking a step back in terms of my views on meme tokens. I don't have any issue with people trading them. I mean, we trade them sometimes, but uh, to me, I don't think they're viable investments in the sense that I wouldn't be comfortable with holding a meme coin for like four years, the way that I'll be comfortable with holding a project with a team. I would be very comfortable trading them. So I don't see them as investments. I see them as trades and I think they're fun trades. Even if you've seen Dogecoin outperforming massively Bitcoin over its lifetime. Yes, I think it's probably just my personality. It's hard for me to mm. underwrite. Um, okay. The only way I can underwrite it is actually, it's quite funny because after the meme coins took off, a lot of funds realized, oh, we can't buy meme coins because our mandate, our LPs will never be okay with this. So they try to over-intellectualize meme coins. They start to write blog posts about how meme coins are the purveyors of culture. These are distribution channels for you to go to market for your products. That is not the case for any of these meme coins. So wait. So, <laughs> but the reason they're writing this down is to then be allowed to buy meme coins in their fund or is just because they want to have something to say? I think it's more of the <laughs> former. I mean, if you have a lot of free time, I, I think the, the latter is worse because it means it. You, you have way too much free time. But the former <laughs> is probably why people are writing these blog posts. But it's actually objectively not what the meme coins are. People just want to buy things because they don't want to play the rigged game of just like, uh, buying tokens with massive overhangs. But if you look at meme coins that try to intellectualize and productize, they actually didn't do so well. Like if you look at Sheep, uh, Shiba Inu coin, they try to become an L2. But uh, if you look at- And the, they raised money recently, right? For the L2. It, yeah, exactly, for the L2. But, but then it kind of kills the meme coin narrative. Exactly, if you look at the performance, but there's not much difference from another meme coin who has no product. So the product really doesn't matter for meme coins. But my thesis before all of this took off was that meme coins are actually a distribution channel, right? It is a way to coordinate social communities. And uh, meme land actually is the only coin that actually does this unironically. And they also suffer for it in terms of price, right? Their performance, if you track them against all the other meme coins, uh, they actually massively underperform because they are not a real meme coin. That's the super interesting thing actually. So the and they destroyed the game in the web to word with memes, right? Yes. So they should be, if you think about it, they should be like the leader, but then it shows that the this meme coin concept is like a completely different thing. Because meme land is a coin about memes. It's mm. not a meme coin. Mm. I think meme coins are very different from what meme land is doing. And that's what I meant when I say that meme land is an ironic meme coin because it's not really a meme coin. And the market agrees with me because yeah, again, look at the performance of with 
Doge, Pepe, all these coins and plot them against Meme, Meme is just massively underperformed. So I think now the market kind of understands what I'm talking about, but obviously that comes at the detriment of performance. So it's like a bittersweet victory. So I'm, I'm making less than the other meme coins, <laughs> but I'm right on my thesis. So for, for me, it's very hard for me to hold Doge for like four years. We've played Doge before, but for something like Meme Land, you know, I know there's a product, I know there's a team that's done this before, so I'm more comfortable holding it. Do you want to be right or do you want to make money? <laughs> yeah, so in this case, I guess we... we <laughs> made some money, but uh, oh, of course, <laughs> but we are also wrong in that. Uh, yeah, it's underperformed all the meme coins. So I, I think, yeah, people are very confused about what the fuck I was talking about when I first explained my thesis for meme coins, and now people are trying to fit the meme land uh, kind of business plan to all the other meme coins out there, and it's not working. Mm. How is the meme coin explosion linked to the current state of venture investing? I think we talked about that, which is uh, venture investors getting access, early access to the best opportunities, which means when they come to market, uh, their valuations are very jacked up. So the returns for retails are perceivably lower. I think one solution is actually ICOs. But with all good things in crypto, it was taken way out of proportion. You have mm. way too many bad actors and scams and you force the hands of regulators. Does that mean that If uh, Suzu is right, people are stopping to buy these high FDV coins, right? Therefore, the market will sort of auto-correct. Does that mean that meme coins have less of a future than what people think? Or do you still think that, as you said before, as a, as a sort of, uh, how do you call that, sub-industry or kind of category has some future? I think the category itself is Lindy, right? It's, mm. it, it is... Uh, you know, empirically true that it's stuck around for every single cycle and it has maintained uh, significant volumes, at least for the top pair like Doge and significant mind share. So I don't think the category will go away. I do think within the category, there's massive rotation right, with pump.fun, which just got exploited. Right? They're printing out like 600,000 meme coins uh, over the past three months. Yeah. So the rotation between meme coins is very, very fast. So if you want to play that game, then that's obviously, you know, your, your, your own choice. But... I do think that over time, uh, the market pendulum tends to swing both ways. So now it's swung to the side of so-called financial nihilism and meme coins and completely away from fundamentals and uh, you know growth and so on. I think it will swing back eventually. Do you think there is a world where meme coins, not like random meme coin that launch on Pum.fun, right? But like, let's say like some of the biggest meme coins of different chains become like the best beta of that chain. And the, the the kind of underlying logic would be crypto is still a, there's a lot of retail people, right? And what are the, we call them normies, or not necessarily less smart than us, right? Like what are they doing when they come into crypto? What's your girlfriend doing when she comes into crypto? Is she buying Bitcoin because it's the, you know, future of money or the digital gold or Ethereum because it's the world computer? Or, mm. or is she like, oh, I want to have some fun. Therefore, oh, Ethereum, what's on Ethereum? That's cool. Oh, I like Pepe. It's fun. I'll buy Pepe, right? Mm. Like, and they go straight to the meme coin of like that specific, like a, a big one, like, mm. right? Or I'll buy with, right, on Solana. So is there a world where this, I mean, actually hear some thesis from like some pretty big guys who are saying like, actually it looks like maybe not for the next 10 years, but like for this cycle, meme coins might be one of the best levered bets on different chains, right? Yeah, I mean, people are obviously using them as such, right? If you look at the performance of native meme coins on uh, first is their base chains, there's periods where they just massively outperform. I think part of that is because of the inflows from retails like you mentioned. Um, but then I think it's also important to remember that the barriers to entry for meme coins are lower than the barriers to entry for L1. So it's much easier to build a with fork than a Solana fork um, and bootstrap it with a community. So I think it's an easier call if you are bullish on retails entering the space for me to buy Solana and hold for like four or five years than to buy with for four or five years. Mm. Because within those four or five years, you might have the next with, you might have the next Solana meme coin. Yeah.
makes a lot of sense. There's a part in this podcast where we talk about alpha. Mm. Alpha, as we talked about before, is not uh, the price prediction, mm. but uh, your favorite project in the space. So we talk before this podcast, we talk about three of them. The first one is Athena. Mm. What is Athena and why do you like this project and this team so much? Yeah, so Athena was pitched to us as an internet bond. It's the first internet native bond. What that means is uh, it is a financial instrument where you can hold and the yield is supposedly coming from nothing but the internet, especially the crypto native internet. So how they do this is you take an Ethereum, a unit of Ethereum, you put it in Lido, you stake it, and then you use that as collateral, you put it on an exchange, and then you short the equivalent amount of Ethereum. So you completely hatch it out. So the bond, supposedly, it's supposed to be at a dollar. And because you're earning the ETH staking yield from Lido and also the funding rate from short ETH, uh, you're earning like 20, 30% average throughout the past bull market. All right, at least that, that, that's, that, that, that's what was pitched to us. And I thought that was extremely fascinating, not because it hasn't been done before. Similar concepts have been done before in DeFi to a smaller scale, but because they kind of challenged the idea of what it means to be crypto native. Right? I think I'll be hard pressed to find a person who doesn't think centralized exchanges like Binance are crypto native. Like they're very crypto only institutions. These are not banks. These are not regulated in the same way as banks. So they're very much kind of crypto. Um, so these guys were the first to think that, hey, actually a crypto native bond doesn't just mean DeFi. It, we can also rely on centralized exchanges. So that was very controversial. A lot of people have thoughts that, hey, you're relying on you know, opaque centralized uh, community uh, you know, entities again. But for me, the justification is that decentralization is a spectrum. If usually the more you trade off decentralization, the more you gain in efficiency. And we've learned from past experiments that are similar before that uh, they were fully DeFi native, that they just didn't get scale because they were doing the hedging on DeFi exchanges. It mm. wasn't liquid enough. Nobody cared. And then these guys were just like, okay, let's uh, let us tweak the parameters a little bit and go a little bit more centralized and rely on a few centralized exchanges. And they instantly hit a scale that was 100x of the last winner. So that tells me they have made the right market choice actually. Um, so I'm very excited about how first principles driven the founder guy is and how yeah. execution focused he is. It's not easy to talk to exchanges and get these partnerships, especially after FTX. These exchanges, I think, have really tightened up in terms of what projects they work with, um, in terms of the risk parameters they have. And the fact that he was able to convince these exchanges to work with him as a new project was also something that really speaks to him as a founder. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really excited to see where they go. I, I hope they don't blow up and we'll see. There's another project I really like, Say. What's so special about Say that made you invest in the project rather than other layer ones out there? Yeah, so in general, we don't invest in layer ones that much, right? We don't like to, we like to invest in apps. Mm. Um, so when Say first pitched us, it was actually an uh, more like an app than a chain. They basically had the insight that all DeFi perp dex exchanges, perpetual swaps exchanges or futures exchanges are very clunky. And it's not because of the app, it's because the infrastructure, even though you have very fast chains like Solana, just wasn't fast enough to support something that could be feature parity with FTX. So they were gonna build a chain that allows you to build a feature parity FTX. And it was a very app-driven thesis that we were very excited about because no other founder was thinking this way. Every other founder was thinking, oh, we're gonna decentralize our chain this way, we're gonna use our ZK proofs this way, You know, our fraud proof model is gonna be different in this way, uh, which didn't really speak to us as kind of app guys. So that's why we chose to work with them. Um, and then over, over time, they kind of expanded the vision a bit to include the parallelized uh, approach they're doing now. And I think over the past year, just seeing both Jeff and Jay, the two founders, one technical, one BD focused, just extremely good at doing what they do. Um, that was also very exciting to see. Uh, last project that you really like is Farcaster. Why are you so bullish on what Farcaster team is building? Yeah, so we're not an investor in Farcaster. We have them DGEN token, which is a token on Farcaster. Uh, I used Farcaster two years ago, and I remember I, I DM'd the founder on Twitter when he was asking for feedback. And I was like, uh, my main feedback is that this doesn't give me too much of a differentiated experience from Twitter. It's basically just Twitter, but on a blockchain. So I don't find myself coming back to this every day. Um, and then two years later, I checked back and they've incorporated so many new features, right? It, it's, it's more than just uh, Twitter for CT now. Um, it's actually... Uh, Twitter, where you can mint coins in the feed itself with the concept of frames. So they've really become a browser, the go-to browser for crypto. 
And I've always been very bullish on the browser thesis. We actually invested in a few that didn't quite work out. Um, but seeing how far they've come since then was very exciting for me. And the other thing is also just objective data as well. If you look at daily active user charts, most social applications go like this. And going back to the point about defying death, I think Farcaster had a moment where it went like this mm -hmm. as well. And then now they're all time high in terms mm -hmm. of users. So the fact that they were able to lose interest in the market and then regain that interest, but at a bigger scale was also a sign to me that we should pay attention. So unfortunately, we're not investors in Farcaster, so we chose to express that through just by buying some DGEN tokens, which is, a, th I believe, a third-party token that someone issued, and it somehow became adopted as the transacting currency on Farcaster. Mm. <laughs> What's something you believe in that most people would not agree with? I think it's been the same for the past four years, which is, I think apps will outperform protocols. Um, especially now, because protocols are getting bid so high. I think I was probably wrong on this last cycle because protocols did, still did so well. Um, but with the way that venture valuations are rising for uh, infrastructure projects and apps are not really following, I do think apps will produce bigger outcomes. And, you know, big example already is Athena, full on just application. And it's already a pretty massive outcome for, for the seed investors, at least on paper. I think that will continue. But this is only a game accessible by VCs still, right? So what you're saying is the outside return will go from layer ones or infrastructure to apps, but still won't be accessible by the majority of the people. Not necessarily, right? The, the biggest example lately was Friend, Friend Tech. Uh, I believe they burned all the VC tokens. Uh, I believe the team doesn't even have tokens. So you can only buy it on, uh, so everybody was buying it on chain. I think people were kind of looking at my address and looking at me buying a lot of friend tokens. Um, I do think there will be more examples of those type of fair-ish launches mm. where the team equity might be funded by a VC, but the token is like just completely community owned. Um, and those could be interesting opportunities. Uh, so on the lookout for more of those. What's your biggest prediction for next 12 months? Next 12 months. Next so the funny thing is uh, we do predictions once a year internally just for fun because we know that it never, ever works out, right? You can never predict where the market goes and if you make decisions off of that, you're screwed. So I think a fun thing is I was predicting that uh, current AI tokens, this is back in January, current AI tokens would do poorly because they're all vaporware. I was completely wrong on that. Uh, I think uh, I was predicting that BRC, like Bitcoin stuff would go away. I was completely wrong on that. <laughs> so never make predictions, uh, but if I must... I do think that a uh, safe one would be Bitcoin hits 250K. Within 12 months? Within 12 months. Safe one. Safe one. Oh, but, I mean, I just gave my track record on predictions. It's no always way. wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> safe, wrong bet. That's safe, what wrong you bet. <laughs> Feel free to fade it. Feel free to fade it. I'm probably wrong on this. Um, What's your thesis on like 250K? Uh, actually, Casper, he mm. said the same. He said, I, th I think he's going to 250K. I think this was like a half meme target that we've always had back, even when I was back at Spartan, we were always talking about one day, 250K. So that was kind of always in the back of my mind. Um, and you think that one day is the next, in the next 12 months? I think so. Well, depending on the elections outcomes, that I think it's possible. <laughs> that would be crazy. I think it's possible. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing this, man. That was super fun. Yes. Thank Lovely. you so much for having me. Thank also. you.